All right, we are live. Welcome, welcome, everyone. And you know how we do this. You're, you're used to this by now. After 40 of these, we're having 40. Been, All right, quite a few. We are, we are live. Going to now welcome, have welcome. A real quick test. It's not a hard test. Don't panic, anybody. Uh, this is just to see if you can hear us and see us. That's going to be really important. If anybody in the YouTube chat room can just say, David, we hear you almost too well. We didn't want to hear you this well, but we do. Just let me know. And then we can start the show. And the show is, for those of you who are wondering what you just wandered into, it is the James Bond Book Club hashtag Fleming Reading Challenge, December version, holiday version, and Bobby Morelli of the wonderful Bobby Morelli have just said we sound good. So guess what? We can start. David West, all the way from Scotland. How are you? Edgar Chapu. My gosh, look at all these people jumping in here. This is fantastic. All right. So we're here to talk about Diamonds Are Forever. And I'm pretty excited about it. I know my, my guest co-hosts are very excited about it. So let's set expectations, shall we? Because what is a book club? Some of you... Um, and I'm going to shut off the music because I'm hearing that the music is very loud. And we tested the music, but there we go. All, all bets are off now. So here's the reality. What is a book club? This is, this is so relaxing. We're not being graded on anything. We asked you all to read a book, Diamonds Are Forever. And we're going to chat about it. My co-hosts have made some great observations. You're going to be making observations. By the way, Paul Lally, um, people are throwing virtual underwear at the screen. They seem to love you in the chat room. We'll get to that in a second. Please, folks, people if are asking. David West, I you. don't want to know. Embarrassing. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that, Mr. Tom Jones of uh, <laughs> book clubs. But the reality is, is that um, this is about just sitting back. For example, I have poured myself a very, very sharp, strong, hold on, mm, martini with a wonderful lemon peel because you hear and see them and he drinks so many of them in the book. So I hope that you are all having a drink, having a libation and relaxing because guess what? For the next two hours, we're going to escape. There's no job shortages. There's no lockdowns. There's no pandemic. There's nobody screaming at you. There's no dogs barking until Mike Poplowski's dogs start barking. We'll talk about that later. But this is just for us to enjoy each other. Okay. By the way, thank you for the compliments on the beard. Um, I'm trying. It's cold out there. It's 16 degrees. So we've got to make do with this. So let's get into some introductions. And then we're going to be talking about a little behind the scenes of Diamonds Are Forever. First of all, I would like to introduce Melanie of Bird, James Bird. Melanie, welcome to the book club. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, Burb is out on a mission right now. So it's just going to be me today. <laughs> well, we have to explain something too. So um, Melanie, your Instagram channel is incredibly pithy and funny because you put your actual bird into all types of James Bond scenarios. What? Tell me what that's all about. Well, it was uh, about two weeks uh, after lockdown in the DC area started back in about uh, late March, early April. And I just thought I wanted some levity and started uh, the Instagram and uh, people seemed to enjoy it and uh, laughing along with me. So uh, that's sort of the story behind that. I'm having a good time with it. Uh, you know, it's a parody so, of James Bond. So I'm having fun. <laughs> I get it. I do. And here's here's the reality. I want to give Melanie um, her due. So I wanted Melanie on this show because she's hosted a lot of other things, but she has such a great, strong opinion. Most importantly, you know, James Bond, like it started out was, oh, look at the, you know, interesting and fun things you do with your pet bird. But you've become a force to be reckoned with in the Bond community. So I'm really excited to have you on today. Well, thank you. Thanks for the compliment. You are very welcome. Now, a gentleman I am not going to compliment um, is my next guest, uh, Mike Poplowski, who I've known, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, probably about 12 years. Uh, Mike and I go way back. He is uh, a gentleman who lives his life 
within the culture of Bonn. And thus his channel is called the culture of Bonn. He has an Instagram where, you know, he doesn't set up any shots. He lives his life and he photographs it for us. And so what he does is he seamlessly invites us into his world of living like Bond. But welcome to the show, Mike. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I've been looking forward for weeks for this. And Mike is, you know, I, I have to say, and I mean this in the greatest compliment, when we talk about nostalgia and traditional Bond, you are a traditional Bond lover. You've seen them in the theater, but, you know, you are a Fleming guy, aren't you? Oh, definitely. It, it's, it's funny because it's so ingrained into my brain that I sometimes forget that there's even a movie Bond. I always think in terms of, of the book, even though the movie is what kicked me off the beginning years ago. And then I had to sneak those books out of the library and hide them under my bed when I wasn't reading them to catch up and say, what is going on here? And that's, were, they, were, they like, were they like your porn stash or not as bad if, you, if they were found? Well, well, slightly, as you're trying, if you're young, when you're about 10 or 12 reading those, and then you hit, um, oh, from, I'm going to draw a blank. Uh, um, National Geographic? The, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 All right, whatever. But the, the one book that stayed in my mind, oh, The Spy Loved Me. Yes. That was like, oh my God, at the time. You know, years later, I reread it, I was like, oh, I didn't know anything when I was 10. I, I, I swear it moved you into puberty. I'm pretty sure of that. And uh, but Mike, thanks, thanks for being here. And we're going to pick your brain pretty, pretty harshly. And this gentleman, Paul Lally, who I not only welcome to the show, but Paul has done some incredible things out there. I, I say very jokingly and with a lot of hand on heart, he is the man of a thousand Bond voices, as long as that Bond voice is Sean Connery. But Paul, welcome to the book club. Oh, thank you. Thanks very, very much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, it's very exciting to be here. I am a Bond fan since I was young, like most of you. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, really just a fan, an eager consumer of lots of the Bond creators and podcasts, uh, uh, not least of which is Mr. Zaritsky, of course. And uh, yeah, I guess if you throw enough comments around, people finally go, hey, get in here and put your money where your mouth is. So I've been invited to talk about this with the heavyweights here tonight. So I'm very excited about it. And I am drinking tonight a black velvet, which is ah. equal parts sparkling wine, usually champagne, uh, and stout, usually Guinness. And it was suggested by Bond to uh, accompany uh, his and Tanner's lunch at Scott's in chapter three of the book. So cheers, everyone. Well done. Cheers. And by the way, cheers. you know, bad on me as a terrible host. Melanie, I believe you've got a drink that uh, you're, you're sipping on. What are you drinking tonight? Uh, mine tonight, I decided since uh, two of our themes in the book is, uh, you know, nothing lasts forever, uh, forever other than death and diamonds. So this is the black diamond. This is uh, equal nice. parts espresso, light rum, and black cacao. So the um, creme de cacao. So the black diamond. <laughs> So we, we should we should get all the answers from you within the first hour, not the second hour. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's kind of what you're exactly. saying. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I gotcha. Um, and, but, and, and it works, it works well for this time too, because we're sort of in between coffee hour and happy hour. So well, it's and it's in a it's in a perfect glass. It's the type of you know glassware you would see in the 40s and 50s. So you're you're styling too, which is great. And and shaken, not stirred, of course. Please, I, you you couldn't come on here unless you did that. And and speaking of uh, shaken, certainly, um, Mike, you you've got some very finicky drink tonight, don't you? Sort of. Uh, it's all over the books. I am drinking the bourbon and branch water, which I have flown in every month from. Uh, Boulder Dam, so they say. So I'm enjoying that tonight. It seems like that was the big th drink for Bond. Everywhere he went, once he was introduced by Lighter, he had it everywhere from Saratoga on. I absolutely love that. All right, so we yes. have our drinks in hand. Uh, do me a favor in the chat room, if you are having something interesting, or I don't care, even if you're having a Coca-Cola, uh, let us know what you're drinking. We always like to check and we watch these back and just to see what everybody's partaking. Hopefully you're just relaxing. Let us jump into this because we're not going to open the book yet because there's some really interesting stories that go along with the writing 
of Diamonds Are Forever. And you, you should hear them because I think they're gonna set up the foundation for the whole conversation and even some of the aha moments that we have. So I'm gonna confer to my notes. Now we've got uh, Jamie Dickey doing an old fashioned. We've got tea, iced tea from Walter. We've got Bailey's from Abe Gianos, a Pepsi from Great Wuta. Pepsi, watch out, that'll, that'll sneak up on you. We've got the Bond influence drinking, wait for it, water. Shamir is drinking red wine with fish. Oh, ho, ho. Mm -hmm. call that man out. Start punching with him on the train. I get it. A clubman from Andrew Storm, whiskey and ginger ale. We've got a bourbon from Not Perfected Yet. Fletcher Skies is drinking gin, cranberry. All right. Suffice to say, we've cleared out the liquor cabinets. This is the Bond community. Welcome to them. We're going to have livers like pate. You can spread <laughs> them. Let's jump in. First of all, during the time when Moonraker the book was being edited, and Fleming was in GoldenEye. He started to actually get inspired to write Diamonds Are Forever. And he was inspired, um, as the story goes, by a Sunday Times article on diamond smuggling. All right, so think about this as almost like 1955, 1956. Um, one of his friends, Percy uh, Silito, Sir Percy, actually, was the ex-head of MI5, was working in security capacity, actually for a diamond trading company for a diamond company that you know very well, De Beers, which is one, still one of the biggest diamond companies. And Percy was basically regaling Fleming with stories. He had articles he was reading with stories with diamonds. And he thought, you know something? My next book kind of has to be about diamonds. So he jumped into it like any good author and started to do a lot of investigation. In fact, he did so much research. He actually wrote a 1957 book called The Diamond Smugglers. That was with the leftover information from this book. We ain't talking about that today, though. Also, and this is really important because say what you will about Diamonds Are Forever, and we will. Um, it's an incredible location book. There's a lot of locations. And this is one of the, the, the most location-oriented book that Fleming actually visited these locations. His friend, Sir William Stephenson, um, sent him a magazine article about a spa town in Saratoga, Saratoga Springs, which, by the way, I'm from pretty close to Saratoga Springs, just FYI. And so they decided to take a little trip. And they went, including Fleming, and visited a mud bath. But en route to the mud bath, this is what happened. They went to an upmarket establishment. They actually took a wrong turn. So they're supposed to go to a very she-she, bougie type spa. Instead, they went to this place that was just a rundown crapatorium. I mean, it was awful. And that became the inspiration of the Acme mud and sulfur baths. All right. So he then met a rich socialite, William Woodward, who introduced him to a new type of car. Point is, is that Fleming drank in, really started to drink in all these experiences of the locations and the people he met. And he put him in a book because when he traveled to Los Angeles, for example, he met with Los Angeles Police Intelligence Headquarters, Captain James Hamilton. That's where Hamilton said, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about gangsters and mafia. And at the time, Fleming admitted his own words that he thought the mafia was just a bunch of palookas, just like he says in the book, eating spaghetti and shooting people recklessly. He didn't know that they were so well organized. And if any uh, people from the mafia are listening, I hope you know I gave you a huge compliment. So leave me alone. Leave me alone. He also went to Vegas. He stayed at the Sands Hotel. He interviewed hotel owners there. He learned the background. Point is, is that Fleming, whatever you want to say about the plot, he immersed himself in this to create the plot and the story that we now have. So we're going to start with Melanie. Melanie, we want to get an overall picture of what you thought of the book from a plot or storyline. How did it hit you? Uh, you know, it's so funny because the, his first five novels are my favorite. I feel like each one of them was done so well. And uh, I hear people who, after reading Moonraker, say, oh, this was kind of a disappointment. And I actually, uh, the, there's so many contradictions in this book. And uh, I'm going to be the contrary voice to say, I think this one is better than Moonraker. 
And uh, I can't wait to discuss in more details why, but I thought it was brilliant. Uh, I really liked all of the pairing that we saw and all of the contradictions and uh, what Fleming was trying to tell us with all of that. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, I, I think too, um, in speaking with folks from England who really love Moonraker and love sort of the setting and then knowing the places and the roads, I kind of feel this way for diamonds because I know all of the American settings. Mm -hmm. So uh, that makes it a little bit near and dear as well. But uh, I just, Fleming to me is always a very intentional writer. He packs these books full of symbolism and little teeny hidden messages for us. And uh, it's something that the first read through, you're just kind of sort of uh, along for the adventure, the second, the third read through, that's when you really start hitting these little nuggets uh, that he has hidden in the book. So it's a personal favorite of mine. So, so let me ask you a specific question around what you just said, because I think one of the areas that gets dinged on, there's, there's something called the, uh, the Fleming sweep, which is how it's a technique that he has that a lot of other authors have recognized of how he ties one chapter to another. So the chapter ends, it's almost like a cliffhanger and it moves into the next one. It gets dinged because some of these chapter sweeps as, as we affectionately call them, seem to be a bit abrupt. Like all of a sudden he's there and then he's there and it's, um, it's a little uh, staccato, if I can use a musical term. Did you not find it like that? Do you feel like the story was connected well together? Um, I did, and you know, to my understanding, this was also uh, going to be a, a stage play, if I'm uh, not mistaken. So mm -hmm. I think, and maybe someone in the chat might know something more about this. Uh, chat, but that please might... speak up. Was this going to be yeah. a stage play? That's interesting. I think uh, that might be why you have some of these abrupt stops and starts is uh, when you're doing things on stage, you know, uh, it curtains down, new scenery, new set, and then the curtain comes back up. Uh, and maybe I'm hoping someone in chat can speak more to this, but that's what I heard. I'm sure they will. And Morgan lisney has got a great point. You know, he, he says um, it's an up and down book, but not bad. You know, if you think about it, it is, if it was written as a stage player connecting to it, that is kind of that, you know, scene by scene type situation, as opposed to if it's written for a movie, it's got to be very fluid. Um, Paul, you know, we want to get your first impressions overall. Think about the plot and the story, how it came together. Was it something that you couldn't put down or was it something that you're like kind of trudging through the snow with? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm first of all, it's fantastic to hear Melanie uh, sing the praises of this of this book, because there is a lot of uh, and you don't want to get swamped into sort of groupthink about this. But uh, when I read that, I was I, I mean, I, I, I had read this like when I was quite young and then I'd left it for quite a while because it wasn't one of the authors that uh, one of the books that stuck with me and coming back to it, I wondered why. And with the, ben the benefit now of being able to, you know, Google all the references really quickly, it suddenly opened up this very fascinating universe outside of the book. Now I know a book should be able to stand on its own and what have you, but, um, and, and forgive me if I mix up the concept of plot and storyline, but for me, I, I was really blown away by how much Fleming really tried to put into this. So he had the diamond smuggling piece of it. He had the uh, corruption in the in the gambling industry, which there, there's a thing called the Kefauver. Forgive me if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. It report. It's mentioned several times in the book. And when I looked into that, like it shows how contemporary he was trying to make it because this was this was taking over the U.S. So kids were being left off school and everything to go home and watch about this because it was a, this so gangsters corruption and all of that was a hot topic and he was trying to put that in he was fascinated by diamonds he had moved away from the smirch in the soviet union and, and that kind of thing and he was as he said himself he put everything but the kitchen sink into this book and i was really engaged for the first third maybe a little bit of this uh, and i was going past it but you know when you're in a great book there are there are things that maybe are a little bit flawed, but you go right past them. You don't even think about them. But this one, I started to go, wait a minute. Why is he wearing a disguise here, but not here? Why is he suddenly getting paid this way? But then he has to go over there to get. So I was getting a little trudged in the second third of the book. But by the time it picked up again with the action at the end, it was great. Um, I wasn't too blown away by the villain 
but I did find it exciting and interesting. And I, the themes in the book are really great as well. But we'll talk about all those. Paul, I have to tell you, you brought up a really interesting point. When I was uh, doing my research on this book, there was, a, um, there was a letter that Fleming sent to his friend after he wrote this book, after he finished. And I'd like to read you what he says. And by the way, the friend that he wrote to Hillary is Bray. named Hilary Bray. Kid you not. All right. He says, I baked a fresh cake in Jamaica this year. He means book. I baked a fresh cake in Jamaica this year, which I think has finally exhausted my inventiveness as it contains every single method of escape and every variety of suspenseful action that I had admitted from my previous books. In fact, everything except the kitchen sink. And if you can think up a good plot involving kitchen sinks, please send it along speedily. <laughs> <laughs> Those are Fleming's words. So to your point, he really did chuck it all in. I mean, it's almost like, you know, when you think about people building stories from old stories and putting it in there, uh, this was one of the, by the way, I have to tell you, great chat going on right now. Adriano 17 says to Melanie and everybody else talking about this being a stage play. He says, uh, this is a book, not a stage play. And Fleming should have made suitable adjustments. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Thomas Ryan, by the way, has a great comment about Paul. He says, Paul Lally shines bright like a diamond, shines bright like a diamond. So these are great comments. Uh, the Paul Lally ones are a little inappropriate, but uh, <laughs> it's a book club. We'll do whatever we want. Mike, your impressions. I, you know, first of all, you you probably read this book over a dozen times in your life. Yeah, but every time is better. Mm. Every time, uh, it, you know, the story, I, I gotta say, you see a lot of the so-called Fleming flair throughout the book. I mean, his descriptions, you, you feel like you're there. You feel like you can taste every meal as you go through it. Um, and it, it's, it's not so much a spy story like some of the others. It's, it's almost like a Mike Hammer adventure that he gets plugged into, but it's a giant travelogue. And like you were saying before about all the different sites he goes to, but it's a travelogue. It's got all these dog legs along. You don't know where you're going to end up in the next step. He gets like dragged along into it. Um, and I was really impressed as reading the beginning when they lead up to him receiving the mission and doing the typical uh, James Bond meets M and the, the chief of staff to go over the mission and they train him on diamonds. You know, you know put the loop in your eye right and blah, blah. But as they, as they go through this, M builds this fear that, you're going to be out there by yourself. You got no support. We, the FBI isn't interested in this, and you're out there to figure out what's going on. Yeah. But you be out of context. So he has no friends, no contacts. Of course, he luckily runs into Lighter later on, who really is a very good friend and kind of hangs with him and does a lot of a lot of support for him unofficially. But that whole fear, you stepping the gangsters, and I was I noted that you mentioned the attitude about the mm -hmm. mafia earlier. And, and I think Bond goes through that transition from the beginning. He's looking at, oh, those spaghetti eating. They're not even Americans, they're Italians, blah, blah. He really downgrades them. And by halfway through the book, he realizes this is an organized machine out yeah. there that not even the FBI can get a handle on. And he's doing it on his own. It's a, it's a great point that's being picked up in the chat room. So Taylor, uh, Q Branch Media says, Fleming's descriptive writing definitely makes you feel like you're there. It is one of the saving graces. Even the dissenters of Diamonds of Forever say, look, you know, it's still Fleming. He still can give you the surround sound of making you feel there. But then you've got a lot of people agreeing with not perfected yet. Not perfected yet says, the villains don't come off too strong for me. Too many characters with little development plus Bond doesn't even take them seriously for most of the part. So guess what? Not perfected yet. You've kicked off a discussion that I want to jump right into. And now we're going to get into details. Everybody take a sip. You're going to need this one. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Hmm. James Bond. Good old Bond. Written by the same author. So he shouldn't change too dramatically. And one of the things that Fleming does as part of his technique is he writes for about three hours in the morning. He does another hour's work between six and seven in the evening. He has a little bit of fun. He doesn't correct anything. That is his usual practice. But in this book, a lot of people have talked about Bond falling in love too easily, Bond kind of disconnecting. 
um, not being the flappable bond, but, you know, almost the too flappable bond, if you will. So let's talk about James Bond in Diamonds Are Forever. And Paul, we're going to start with you. Talk to us about your bond in Diamonds Are Forever. How did he strike you? Sure. So I actually like the character of James Bond in this. I know I take a different view to uh, the one where he falls in love too easily because I think um, one of the, I mean, James Bond is a male fantasy and he's sent, the core of him is his masculinity and Fleming uses that very much. Um, everything he does, he dresses up around that. So the, um, the fact that, um, the fact that, for example, Tiffany Case doesn't like women because she's had a, horrendous or sorry doesn't like men because they're a horrendous background just makes her tougher to be a conquest the fact that these guys he keeps you know he keeps um downgrading these uh, gangsters as sort of low grade and everyone else is trying to raise a stake on they're really tough is to make these guys much bigger so that bond is then the, the the bigger hero when he comes in however in this book we also see he is vulnerable he hurts he he pains he said he gets the wrong he does the wrong thing and there there are consequences his his friend ernie cuneo is shot and then he has his vengeance and he's angry and you feel that there's a bit of the timothy dalton bursting the balloon moment and then when he gets beaten up he also sort of loses his willpower he's very human here and he's actually quite tender with uh with tiffany in in the love scenes at the end and there's a development and discussion he's he's very he's too macho to, to sort of say you know wow felix I, I i really you know what happened to you is terrible but they have this tenderness between them unspoken as well there's a lot there's a lot in there with friendship his his thoughts on death his thoughts on um on love and marriage this is one of the high points of diamonds for me is the james bond character plus the lifestyle stuff but i'm gonna let michael talk about that <laughs> well paul i will tell you something i agree with you, not 99%, but 100%, because one of the notes that I put down as Bond, as character, uh, I loved him in this book, mostly because he's a little bit more like me. So I, I could identify with him. You know, the, the, the movie Bond, he's a superhero. Mm -hmm. none, none of us are, you know, that wonderfully lucky in, in, in many cases. And you can read into that how you want. But this Bond in this book, he makes mistakes, and he yeah. pays for them. Mm -hmm. Like there's consequences. Like, I do every single day. He feels pain. He feels regret, falls in love. I mean, and by the way, um, for those, of, there's some people that said he, he falls in love too hard in this, uh, every book, because that's Fleming. Fleming, mm. you know, by his own admission, falls in love, you know, two sexy legs walk into a room <laughs> and he slowly does elevator eyes up or the gaze. Um, and then he, falls in love. So that's not unusual. Bobby Morelli from Match Perfectly has a great point in the chat room. You know, even Bond's moments with Tiffany, like the dinner scene with Tiffany is fantastic, where she says to him, I don't want to drink your vodka martinis yes. under false pretenses. Nice. I mean, that type of tit for tat allows Bond to be fleshed out. Um, and, and Paul, I'm going to kick off uh, my next part of the discussion because you said it's, it's a gentleman fantasy. But I think it's also Melanie's fantasy, Bond, and, and the Bond interactions. Melanie, what did you think of Bond in this book? Uh, yeah, you know, one of the things that I always, and it, it is interesting being a female Bond fan, uh, because sometimes we hear about that from other women. Like, how on earth can you be a, a female and, uh, and still enjoy this? And um, I think... I think a couple things uh, because he is so human. He is a very flawed person. He really is. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of you see him battling his own demons. Uh, I think throughout all of these books, you see him wanting to be like the white knight. He wants to be the hero. These women need rescuing and he wants to be the one to swoop in and, you know, swoop them off their feet and rescue them in a sense. Um, and then the other thing I, I felt about Bond in this particular book, uh, and Jill, I, we'll talk about this in, in detail, especially when it comes to the, uh, the villains and the henchmen and everything else. Uh, this book in particular is all about contradictions. Mm. And so right off the bat, you have M telling him, you need to be extremely careful. This is a very dangerous mission. 
And then he gets to the airport and he's sucking down oxygen and getting high and being very careless. So you see this I'm like in. back and yeah, yeah. So like, it's almost like everything he's being told he's, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily arrogance or just, uh, or if Fleming was sort of working that into his writing because he really wanted to stress these opposites. That's so, a great uh, point. And, and by the way, it, that isn't that bond. And isn't that us? You know, someone tells you not to touch a hot oven. God bless. That thing is glowing so bright. How can I not? Mark Edlitz, who we just had a book launch in the chat room, says Bond falls in love quite easily in all the books. And he's always told not to, you know, um, not to quote a movie quote, but it's like, you know, shadows stay behind, not on top. But Bond loves to be on top. I'm so oh, sorry. The conversation I did that. about him having kids, too. Uh, you know, here he is, this assassin going about. And he's like, yeah, I'd love to get married and have kids one day. Wait, what? <laughs> And that weird advice he gives if he had a son. What does he say? Something like, I, I, I tell him to spend it, spend your money on what you like, but not on something that eats or some strange, uh, strange advice that he has. Yeah. And some, it's something strange too. Bernays sauce is involved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just go to, oh yeah, the Bernays sauce. Yes. Yeah. Well, Mike, since you're warmed up and you just spoke, um, I got to get your opinion of Bond as somebody that lives the Bond lifestyle day in and day out. How was the Bond in this book? Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, Melanie hit right in the head. He's human. You go back in previous books, he, he, he you know, he goes up against Spectre and he realizes, oh, I, I have some shortcomings here. I have to be professional. I have to do this. And yet he got something for those women. And, you know, he, you know, with Tiffany Case, immediately he starts like putting little moves on her and she turns him off. But then it, it seems like his motives really, as you said, he's got to, he's got to get information from her. Especially when he, I think when he's at the 21 club, he tries. And again, later on when they're at the, uh, in, uh, in, in Vegas, I think when they go to dinner, but he's really trying to get, connect all the dots, all, all, all the, all uh, the, uh, gangsters and the families and, and trying to find the end of the other end of the pipeline, you know, the, the top, the yeah. top of it. Um, but it's like, and I always get this, I know there's an article in here somewhere about the misogyny of Bond, but most of the time, I go back and really review this, is he's just doing his job for England. He's trying to get information and maybe it's a fringe benefit to it all. Um, and his humanity comes out, and then the, his Englishness, if you will, I, that, that whole scene when he goes to the mud baths, it's almost like he's cringing at the idea of what's gonna be behind that, that, that chip paint, young, ugly screen door and Mary's laying there and, and the idea comes, Felix Leiter, he yeah. must be laughing right now. <laughs> I just, I, I think it was, it was great. You, you, you really could feel what he's going through and he doesn't know what's going to happen next. He's just got to go through the next door and see what's going to happen. And sometimes he makes decisions that are right. And sometimes yeah. he's pushing, as a, as a point I was going to make, sometimes he's coming up to, at a dead end and he knows he's going to force something, deceiving a decision from the gangsters. Well, you, all right, so let's unpack what you just said, because I mean, I think that's why I, I spoke in the beginning about Fleming. I really feel Fleming's bond, and I'm going to call it that, Fleming's bond in this book, maybe more so than others, because hearing that he involved himself in all these locations and the mud baths and things like that, you really hear disdain, or you hear excitement about trying um, a drink like Paul's enjoying right now. You know, you can hear Ian Fleming starting to relax a little bit. And this is his fourth book. So he's, he's sitting back and he's like, I don't have to put myself into a character because maybe Ian Fleming can now put himself into Bond as opposed to Ian Fleming trying to pretend to be Bond. And that, I think that's the Bond we get. And Ian Fleming, with all his, um, you know, people say he, he was very bougie and snobby, but, you know, bougie and snobby, when people feel that way, they're actually doing it mostly because they feel... Um, an issue with their relevance. And I know I'm going to get into behavioral science, but that's typically what it is. So they feel like they don't have the relevance that they quote unquote deserve in their head. I found that this was served up in the book in a really weird and wonderfully way. But with the villains, and let's talk about the villain. And Mike, we're going to start with you with the villains. And, and I want to talk about the main villain, not the henchman yet. But when you talk about the Spangled Mob, when you talk about the Spang Brothers, um, it was interesting because I felt, here's my opinion, 
I felt what lacked in this book was other than Winton Kidd, which we'll get to, the main villains, you know, I hardly knew ye. You know, I didn't really get them fleshed out like other Bond books where you know Goldfinger, you know these other people in Moonraker and Live and Let Die. You really get to know them. These other ones are so surface level, I just feel like it wasn't there. Although I did get a kick out of the fact that Bond does shoot down a helicopter, just like Inspector, to kill one of the Spang brothers. But Mike, what did you think about the Spangs? You know, I th I think what it was is it was a family a family uh, organization. It was spread out. You couldn't focus on any one of them. You know, and he was picking up pieces as he followed the pipeline. So you get a little bit here and a little bit there. Like uh, when he's in London, do uh, they were unsure if that was a Spang brother, uh, Mister uh, uh, Sayers Sayers? It was like, and if you didn't really pay attention, you start losing track of who was what, and then you find at the end, I think. There's a Spang brother on each end. Um, but I think I think one of the villains I thought, even though he didn't have a lot of time on it, uh, was uh, Shady Tree. Mm. I thought he was a great description. I mean, from the beginning, you're kind of, and Bonded walks in that office. And he's just watching his steps. What can I do to kind of do a little provoking without stepping over the edge? And tr basically trying to develop the situation and get into the pipeline fully so he can follow along. Um, I think also when he, I think he meets Shady, if I remember right, my mind's going, when uh, after he, do not go down to Vegas, do your thing, and that's it, don't do any other gambling, and of course he pushes it, and I think Shady Tree gets involved and talks to him again about that, and he has to make I, up his story. And by the way, mea culpa, I love Shady Tree. I, I you know, first of all, um, and, and I know this is a bit controversial in 2020, but, you know, one of the things that Fleming did was he would take descriptors and things that were off the quote unquote norm, you know, describing him as a red haired hunchback, which um, Mr. Hume is uh, our, our friend author is on this right now um, and calls himself the, uh, the, the author ginger, but, you know, red haired, you know, being a, uh, to, to Fleming possibly a, a, you know, a disconnect and hunchback, of course, you know, to him being a disconnect. I thought he was written perfectly. But the Spangs, I just, I felt like they were this kind of surface level, but I could be totally wrong here. I mean, Melanie, what was your, you know, that, that villain, they say that a Bond book or a Bond movie is only good as its villain. What did you think? And I'm smiling because again, I'm going to be the contradiction here. I'm going to say, I, I thought they that. were excellent. Uh, the reason being is I found it really interesting. Uh, the first time I read it through, I will fully admit, yes, there aren't any strong characteristics about them. So they tend to be a little bit forgettable. But on the second, third read through, one thing that's very, very apparent with this book is everyone comes in pairs. So you've got Wint and Kid, you have the two Spang brothers. Um, mm. And I found that really interesting, especially as we talk about how there are so many contradictions in this book and uh, we're really dealing with opposites here. So when we look at uh, Serafimo, oh. Uh, the, the brother who's in Vegas. Uh, and again, you're dealing with opposites. You've got the glitz and glam of Vegas. And then you have this old rundown dead Specterville. Uh, another thing that I found really interesting is uh, Serifimo, which is derived, the name derived from Seraphin, which is the highest order of angels. Mm. And if you're an art history buff, uh, the seraphim angels are always displayed uh, with six wings and a cherub child's face. And what is it he's doing? He's out in the desert playing cowboy like a kid. So he's the head of this crime organization, the boss boss. And he's out playing cowboys and trains in this dead village. So I, I loved that uh, that sort of paradox there uh, we're dealing with. Um, and Jack, I mean, you don't, you don't see as much as Jack other than, you know, to, uh, you know, he's in the glitz and glamor of the, you know, House of Diamonds. And I think you're sort of seeing again, the, uh, the posh plush luxury, and then sort of uh, the other end of this that's out in the desert, the barren desert with the scorpions and the dentist. Um, 
So again, I, I really liked how everything was in pairs and everything worked opposite of each other. I got a kick out of that, but Melanie, I will hundred percent agree. The first read through forgettable. I, I So first of all, I, I, how dare you make me like this book better than I did before? How dare you? Um, but I love that you're doing it. Uh, th th yes, I mean, and, and it's interesting too, because the problem with my questions, and I'll, I'll take this on the chin, is that I'm separating the villain with the henchman, but really you've got to take them as a whole. Because one of the things that Fleming does is he doesn't really separate all of the evil, maniacal nature of people through the villain versus his henchman. He combines them all together. Um, so doing that, I mean, we've got to also talk about Winton Kidd, but I'd like to move the conversation to a villain himself, Paul, um, you know, whether it's the main villains or the henchmen, let's, let's start mixing it up. Let's, dude, let's get crazy. Cause you know, we're what? drinking. It's a Saturday. Yeah. It's all fine. It's nuts. What yeah. did you think about them? Well, first of all, before I, I mean, I, Count me dumb as mud for not having gotten all the levels that Melanie saw in there. I mean, uh, it turns out we were reading the Odyssey level depth rather than <laughs> a, a spy thriller I thought I was into. But um, yeah, I, I, I kind of, I, I actually would have to agree with you guys. I, I, Shady Tree for me stood out because he was a proper nasty bastard. You know, he was a tough guy. You could see Tiffany winced every time she spoke about him. And also he was thin skinned when Bond sort of didn't pay the outfit, the respect that the, that he felt that they deserved. He got a little bit uh, prickly about it. I enjoyed him a lot. Um, the villains for me, uh, the Spang brothers, I, I was, I was into it at the start. I was, I was ready. I felt this threat uh, when they went to see him, the house of diamonds, but, and it was Rufus B. Say and so forth. But, you know, and I, I love in Bond, I love the way they like to mix a little bit of the, 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 the sort of surreal humorous stuff. Like, for example, in Dr. No, we have the three blind mice who are deadly killers, live and let die. We have, you know, a, a, a also sort of crazy characters who are deadly killers. But here, when Spang turned up in the full Western outfit, I was like, I, man, this is too much. It feels like there's too much benzedrine in the corn, in the cornflakes there, you know. Um, so I, I was, I was a little let down by the the main villains themselves. I just felt like, as I say, that that second third of the of the book started like, where are we going? When are we going to get to these these tough guys? And they were built up so much, it felt like a letdown to me. But I did not see those interesting patterns that Melanie made. But um, I think that, that, that what it says to me is for Bond nuts like us, there's a wealth of detail to be found in there, but I don't think this is going to be the book that's going to get a new generation of Bond fans who are coming off a film or, or, a, or a video game into Fleming. That's the only point I would make based on those villains. That's a really good point. And I think a lot of it is, you know, I always tell people when they, when you watch the news or you read a book or you watch a movie, you know, it's the old Luke Skywalker going into the cave in Empire Strikes Back. You, you take, you know, you basically encounter what you take with you. So Alex Lamas in the chat room has a really good point about the Spang brothers. And he says, I found the Spang brothers pretty terrifying. Why? He grew up in little Italy in New York during the eighties. So he probably knew people like the Spang brothers. Now I'm not saying anything, uh, dark and maniacal doesn't happen in Ireland, but it's interesting how he could probably, you know, recognize the face of the Spang brothers. Yeah. When it came to, for me, and Mike, we're going to move to you right after I, I make this uh, statement, with Winton Kidd, I had trouble, and I'm going to, again, hand on heart, I had trouble because <laughs> the movie kept flashing in my head, Diamonds Are Forever of Winton Kidd, and this comical, wonderful couple um, that were, you know, kind of snarky and one of them could act and one of them couldn't act. And I kept trying to make the correlation and bat on me. That's not what we should do when we read these. You know, I wanted to, you know, recognize that Fleming's writing this one guy, you know, wiping off his brow and he's all red faced and everything like that. And they're in hoods for three quarters of the book and then they're not. But I wanted to enjoy Winton Kid more than I did. And then when there was the reveal of Bond going, my gosh, it's Winton Kidd. It's like, well, yeah, the reader knew, you know, 200 pages out of 266 pages ago. So I'm just, I don't know. There was a slight disconnect for me. Mike, Winton Kidd, what, what do you think about them? Uh, I, I enjoyed them. 
they they you think you mentioned it just now they they were a scary group you never saw their face they always show up in hoods no one knew what they look like and as you get to the, the background descriptions you know was it the, i forget which which one one had the uh one was bald i think and one was uh, had the, the white hair so they would stand out so they had to wear hoods and that whole scene when he really first time really runs into them at the uh the mud, the mud baths, the whole how ah, how do you call it? Uh, in inhuman, hmm. you know, to not kill the guy, but I, I put a serious hurt on on uh, the poor jockey. You know, like, throw all the hot mud right on him, and uh, then when he meets up with them again, they're the ones that, that kick the crap out of him with the the boots, right? And which is kind of a weird thing, but you know what was actually happening? He lived through all that abuse, but they were just the hired guns and he didn't know when they're going to pop up until finally at the end, you know, but Bond doesn't after all the pieces fit together. Uh, and the, the background information too, but you know how, how uh, Fleming pops up with his little comments about homosexuality. It was there too, but it was, it was, it was lower. It would pop up once in a while. You almost forgot about it. And it really kind of comes around, I, I guess, in uh, the, the final scene, the big showdown in the, uh, hmm. the Queen Elizabeth state room shoots one the other one gives that that scream like that, that it, it's his lover type of thing and it goes from there but i thought they were a, a very scary couple and, and by the way mike i don't know if he screamed because he was lover or just screamed like like if you got shot i would scream yeah. with joy so i mean yeah. i think there is just from your point of view sorry mike yeah. um <laughs> but i will say this the the mud scene for me was one of my favorite scenes because it's it's and again Melanie this is something that you said earlier it's there's such a helplessness to bond you know here is this secret agent we picked up this book because we want to read the antics of bond you know this amazing superhero like the best secret agent ever and he sit there in a coffin of mud i thought you know say what you will about this book i thought that was so well done where i was reading this um, in a lounge chair in my room and I'm just sitting there and I felt almost suffocated like he did. And then that's the power of Fleming is to put you into that moment. I mean, Melanie, did you, did you kind of get that a little bit in that scene? Absolutely. Where he felt so, so helpless. Yeah. It's a hundred percent. I, I think the, the, one of the big things that I walked away with too was just all of the, uh, the bugs and flies and just it's I mean you you really get that feeling of death when you go in there like uh we have a lot of insect references in this book yes. the scorpion and the flies and the ants and uh the minute he walks into the mud bath and he's on the bus with the woman who's got the veil on like a beekeeper so it's just uh it's this very foreboding scene and then for them to come in uh, with the hoods on, almost just like the Grim Reaper. Ooh. Uh, All right, so was. Melanie, I, I agree with Mike. You're, you're going to be elected. Every time we do a book club, we're going to have you analyze these because you're like the behavioral <laughs> scientist of, of James Bond community. I, I'm I just totally, a nerd. <laughs> I love that, though. I, I think it's great. But, you know, it's interesting because a couple people in the chat room are saying, you know, the, the train scenes, for example, and I know we're, we're jumping a little bit, but that had a lot to do with the bad guys. And that was a big disconnect for me. Like I'm very invested in this book. And I, I should have said in the upfront, I, I did not read this book as quickly as the others. There were, there were some like Moonraker that I, I could not put down. And I'm, I'm so looking forward to From Rush With Love because I know I'm not going to be able to put it down. This one I had to keep picking up. And the train scene was a big disconnect where it's kind of hard to follow what's going on. And I count myself as a semi-intelligent guy but with the bad guys and the train scene and the plot and trying to follow that i had a disconnect paul uh train scene bad guys shooting were you there with it do you know what i had that was the one i had to go back and read again and uh and i someone made a comment to me they were like i neither understood it nor cared about it and i was thinking oh Ooh. damning you know and, and and i was thinking i cared i cared enough to go back because I, you know, it's it's Fleming. I want to understand the story and everything, but it did get really muddy around that part, and I was just sort of, you know, okay, keep going, and it's worth it in the payoff because it does start to get exciting and it does start to build. But again, like it, 
even asking me to review that piece now, I'm like muddled to go, what was that? You know, it, it is a bit, that is, I feel, where, and it, it's, you know, Fleming tried his hardest. This is the difficult fourth novel for, for Fleming. And he, he tried to put everything in together, but it just doesn't meet the sum of its parts. And unfortunately, there are some amazing parts and some of them that are just a bit like sluggish. You know, they, I know Calvin Dyson did a great uh, uh, discussion as well about the oxygen piece. I mean, Melanie, you, you made it very entertaining, but the whole oxygen thing at the airport is like, you know, this kind of hasn't dated so brilliantly. Like, hey, sucked on some oxygen. I did like the point, though, that it, may, it was a lapse in concentration for him. That was the best thing to take out of it. So there's always something to take out of these scenes. But those ones were a little bit more difficult to get through. Yeah, that's, that's a very, very good point. And I'll, I'll tell you what, we're going to we're going to move to a discussion. I want to start with Mike, because we, we need to talk about the femme fatale. We need to talk about Tiffany Case. And we're gonna we're gonna start with Mike on this because one of the great things that all of you should know is that Mike um, was attracted and met his wife because she looked, you know, flaming red hair like Tiffany Case. Um, Deneen, your beautiful wife, uh, I believe, is a spitting image of Tiffany Case, and that was part of the attraction, correct? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Did I get she's your wife's of, name right? She's she's more of a Barbara Stanwyck looking person. <laughs> oh, is, is, is her name Deneen? Donna. Crap me. <laughs> what did you think about the, what did you think about Tiffany Case in this book as he uh, segued terribly? I, I thought she was freaking great. I mean, Ooh. from the moment he met her and she was, and it's funny, it was right before this, I went back to watch the movie to kind of compare with Jill St. John. And Jill St. John was okay, but the Tiffany Case of the book, all her, her background, her abuse that she went through, her mother, the, you know, all of that. And then she took the money and she got away and then she worked her way up, you know, uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, jobs that she acquired and learned cards and ended up working in Vegas. And then of course, into the gangsters and all that and doing that, that side job with the diamonds. But she seemed to be very much in control of herself. She, I don't know how to put it, well-kept, had tastes, had flair. Her 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 style was, was really stunning. And, and every time she comes in, comes into a scene, Bond is describing everything down to the watch, everything she's wearing. And we mentioned before about his weakness for women. And it's like from the first meeting, he's already thinking about it. Oh yeah, by the way, I need to get information too while I while I'm at it. Uh, but uh, yeah, two missions combined to one. That's okay. Um, she was good, and even up, you know, through the book, she was still questioning. But she seemed, after a while, she kind of rolled into it too. But she seemed to fall in love with him with all, with all the abuse she had. She was like the big, the big discussion over the Bernays sauce and all that on, on was led up to the Queen, Queen Elizabeth. It's like she was ready. It was like this is the typical Bond. This is the guy. This is the ultimate, and she was ready to commit to it all. But I thought she was a great character. I think he took the time to really develop her. I have to tell you something. The chat room is 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 a lit because of this conversation. Tim Hans has a great point. This, unlike Winton Kidd, I was able to transcend the thought of Tiffany Case. And I love the book, Tiffany Case. But Tiffany Case, Tim, Tim Hans says, Tiffany Case in the movie, unfortunately, descends into a bimbo. Yeah. And it's a strong word, but quite frankly, she starts out very smart and then goes into okay. bimbo world. Um, I thought Tiffany Case was probably the most like Bond that we've ever seen Fleming write a woman. And what I mean by that, and here are my notes, she's tough, she's lonely, she's insecure, and she's been honed through trauma. That's James Bond. Yeah. And I really love how, you know, she's tit for tat, quite frankly, uh, a, a force to be reckoned with, with Bond. She is not a bimbo. We don't take her out. And even her card sharkery, is that a word? I don't think it is. Card sharkery is just so capable like Bond would be. But Bond Melanie, I want to get your perspective. Uh, Tiffany Case, like, dislike? I I absolutely adore her. I nice. love her. Everything that both of you said and more. Um, I think uh, one of the beautiful things when I, 
in reading this now and today, uh, we're in the midst of this pandemic, we're under lockdown. One of the main themes of this book, one of the main things that Fleming says is nothing lasts forever, right? Only uh, death and diamonds are sort of permanent, right? Those are forever. And I feel like Tiffany so embodies that because all of the abuse that she went through that she was able to leave in the past, like this isn't going to last forever. Uh, when at the end, when Bond is talking uh, with her after the mission is over and uh, Fleming writes in there, like it's, she didn't think twice about it. She was ready to just move forward and move on. And I just thought that that was such a beautiful reminder to all of us that this isn't forever. You know, uh, we can put this in the past. Um, we're going to move past this. And I just thought it was a lovely reminder. And uh, just the first meeting of her as well. I absolutely loved uh the record that was playing, I found it on uh, YouTube, the entire thing and was listening to that. And the symbolism involved there from the, um, the title here, what is it? Uh, I'm gonna butcher the French, uh, Fues Mort, which is well, literally translates. Really well. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> which, the Foyer Mort. Is the, is Foyer it? Mort, which, which uh, I looked literally translates to dead leaves. Like the, you have the death in there mm, and then it moves yes. on to the next song, Jatron Day, which is I'll wait. And then she stops the record at Je ne connais pas la fin, which is, I don't know the end of it. And I thought that that was just so beautiful and telling with her storyline. And, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I, I loved her. I loved everything about her and exactly what you and Mike said as well. Just she, she was a very good match for Bond. By the way, Am this I is, uh, I, I, I will tell you the chat room is giving so much love to Tiffany Case, whether it's, you know, the whole idea of Calvin Dyson talking about being written like Bond, you know, and, and definitely, you know, even he goes so far as to say is almost as good as Gala which is amazing. Alex Lamas saying Bond falling in love with Tiffany was more real and believable than his love affair with Vesper Lynn in the book. I mean, quite the compliment. But Paul, we got to get a, a perspective from you as you're reading this. And I think uh, it sounds like from your vernacular that you had a couple of faults with the book as well. Tiffany Case, did she rise above that for you? From from my vernacular? Interesting. Um Okay, well, I'm not going to dissent from the group and say that uh, I don't like Tiffany Case. I think Tiffany is an outstanding character. From from the minute she gets, uh, she she meets Bond, the dialogue is sparkling and it's it's really good. What confused me a little bit about Tiffany was, you know, we Felix describes her background as this brutal assault that she is subjected to at the age mm. of sixteen when some thugs come around to her mum's place because she's running a cat house. Um, now obviously, that's going to impact someone deeply and for a long period of time yeah. and as to how they build relationships. But the first time we meet her, she's sitting half naked in a room when this guy she's never met uh, before comes in, to the, in, in, in and sort of, it's sort of a, a, a what's happening there. Is she putting herself out there as a sex object, despite the fact that, you know, she's had this background or is she just simply so comfortable in herself that she just really doesn't care? And I'm wondering, did Fleming give much thought to that or is he just really directing this as a whole male fantasy kind of thing? So um, so that that was a little bit confusing. What are we trying to take from that? I, I, I was kind of thinking, but I love... I mean, obviously the girl has to fall for Bond and the thing. And, and I, I was thinking, you know, it's a little bit, how much am I going to believe that, you know, she hates men all her life, but when she meets someone who's handsome and capable enough, then it's all fine again, you know? That may well be very possible. I do not know anything about people who've gone through that kind of trauma. But for me, it's like, how believable is that? I don't know. I don't know. But yet... He does write it with some very tender lines. There's some very interesting discussions. So I'm kind of, yeah, no, yeah, maybe. Uh, so <laughs> I was a little bit jumping from left to right with her, but she is definitely one of my favorite um, female characters in the Bond series, for sure. It sounds like you could be one over, Paul, is what you're saying. 
Oh, I could be. No, and if I walked into <laughs> Tiffany Case's place and she was wearing underwear, playing money music like that, I'd be like, yeah, definitely one over, you know. One more Guinness, and I think we got you. To be <laughs> Uh, so I I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, we are a group of friends. And I mean that out of the, the hundreds of people on this right now, uh, the, the, the four of us in this group, we're friends of Bond. But let's jump into Friends of Bond in this book. And we've got to start with Felix Leiter, um, who's a Pinkerton now. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm okay. <laughs> the fact that he's got a hook and uses it uh, to, to, you know, his, his benefit is really interesting but Felix Leiter played a pretty significant role in this book. Am I wrong? Uh, Melanie, what do you think? Absolutely. I, it was so great to see him come back. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, you know, I love all of the scenes between Felix and Bond, all of them. I just, I love those exchanges, the wit, um, you know, and um I, I missed him in Moonraker. <laughs> I will fully admit I missed him in Moonraker. So it was great to have him come back. Uh, loved that Felix was the one who sort of saved the day at the end when uh, in, on their way out of Specterville, he comes kind of swooping in, uh, just like in Casino. Uh, the, I'm, I've got to be, like I said, I got to be a nerd here. The actual name Felix means lucky. So I love that, uh, you know, he saved him with Cassine in Casino with the money and, you know, he's, he lucked out that he didn't lose his life and live and let die. And now here he is again, the lucky uh, hero partner of uh, Bond. So I just, I, I find that luck tends to be one of the running themes throughout all of these uh, Fleming books, the, you know, luck versus actual like planning and skill. Yeah. So uh, it was so appropriate that he was the one to kind of come in and save the two of them when things well, were looking so bleak. I love that you noticed that because one of the things I found in this book versus some of the other books with Felix is Felix is there not just to lead Bond from one moment to another, but to really make sure that Bond is enjoying his life. I mean, here's Felix. He's been freaking eaten by a shark. He's got a hook for a hand. Um, I was almost ready to go into the movies where he's lost his wife, but that's not the case. But he is leading him through enjoying life. And I think that having those moments there with Felix really brought the levity up and the lightness up a little bit. Now, as somebody that looks for lightness in everything that they do, Paul, what did you think about Felix and, and what he did for the book? Uh, I, I'm just going to note that down and have a bit of self-reflection after the call, a call but, uh, <laughs> but thanks for that. Um, how do I feel about Felix? Well, I mean, I think like everyone, I was I was happy to see Felix back. The the the, the friendship that they have, the 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 acerbic banter, um, but it's all very sort of well meant and 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 um, and and joyous. But you know what's great about it is when he feel, Bond is walking down the street and he feels this presence, and he feels like it's dangerous. And then of course it's Felix playing a, a trick on him. I'm embarrassed to say the first thing I saw, I thought of was like, oh, that's a bit like never say never again when he comes and throws him on. I was like, Ugh, purge that from my mind. But um, it, it, it is good the way Bond looks at him and looks at the devastation that's been wrought on his friend as he watches him with the heavy limp, watches him with the hook and notices that Felix has absolutely zero sense of self-pity just getting on with it. Uh, I mean, this, this is this is tough stuff, you know. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool, and it's, it's it's lovely to watch them as friends. Felix always does play second fiddle to Bond. That is something we have to take into consideration. You know, Bond yeah. always wins, and Felix is there as the support. But they they are they are great, and and he he's I think there's a, there's something about Felix where he wants to show off a little bit to show that he hasn't been diminished by his injuries. Driving the Studelac, is that how you pronounce that? Thing? Yes, yeah, beautiful yeah. car. And he's, he's driving it really fast and Bond thinks he's showing off. But there, there is a fantastic relationship there where they sort of reassert themselves after the devastation that has gone before and live in that time. It is a great relationship. And I do want to say that there has been a change in the first hour of this Bond book club where people were throwing underwear at Paul Lally and now they're throwing now they underwear me. at Melanie. Oh. We've got <laughs> Alex Lamas who is telling that Melanie is a genius. We've got <laughs> another gentleman throwing 
uh, I guess, certain invitations to Melanie's way. We're very protective of Melanie, so please back <laughs> off is all I'm saying. Um, but this is very nice, and it's not good for Paul's ego, no. but it's great for Melanie's. That's all I'm saying. Uh, by the way, Miguel, yeah, we have to talk about this because Mike Poplowski, I think, has long thought of me as his Felix because he lives the Bond lifestyle. He's much more Bond than I am. So, Mike, I got to get your opinion. Felix Leiter in this. I mean, this was really fleshed out. What did you think? I, I, well, I, I, you have to admit, if Felix hadn't stepped in, had seen Bond and stepped in from mm. New York, Bond probably couldn't have accomplished his mission, right? When he left them, you're on your own. Don't expect the FBI, the CIA, or any other support. And don't get killed. And Felix pops up, grabs him outside Sardis, and leads him and teaches him. Uh, everything that has, you know, he has to know about, you know, uh, uh, moving through the the country, what he's got to get done. Yeah. Uh, and plus he had a big background of the gangsters. Um, it was talk about a super, super happenstance that he walked into him. And, and then and then he ends up going to Vegas, too, you know, nice. and, and saving him there. Yeah. Um, the, the, what threw me a little bit was the meeting when he went to Saratoga. The dude lack. I love that. I've driven that the Connick Highway or Parkway twice in the last year. It, it's wow. great. Um, and stayed in Saratoga overnight uh, the last time. Just, of course, it's off season for, for uh, uh, the races at that point. With your wife, Tiffany Case. Yeah, exactly. She came too. Yeah. She came too. But it, it's funny that, well, we can't be seen together, but we'll drive up together. I'm like, these guys have people everywhere. They're, you're not going to be seen. And then they would meet for dinner every night, which I thought was a great thing. But, mm. you know, Fleming, it's all about the eating and the drinking and the camaraderie. But you're, you're, you're kind of kind of stretching. The, you're taking a chance here being caught, you yeah. know, but but it's show, <laughs> I, I think deep down it's it, it's it's how Fleming demonstrates, even though he has negative comments at times about the United States, maybe he was. Uh, uh, that lost the empire, the U.S. is there, but it kind of shows his love for the United States. The, from his perspective, the, the idiosyncrasies of the United States. Well, let's, you know? let's talk about that, Mike. You bring up a really good point, and it's actually embedded in the chat room. So we've got A.J. Chowdhury, who uh, ace toots in the chat room, has a question for the panelists, and I think that three out of the four of us are pretty ready to answer this. Um, I'll even start. But um, Ace Toots says, question for the panelists, how well do you think Fleming captures the American idiom? I mean, Melanie, you talked about Americanism right from the get-go. He loved many aspects of the States. Do you think he captures the U.S., uh, albeit circa 1956? And I will say that he nailed it. I mean, you know, that's one of the things in the United States. I mean, there are, it's interesting. We love the compliments, but we really hate the insults, but the insults are sometimes deserved. So how we were in the 1950s, 60s, or 70s in some of these Americanisms, you know, we need to embrace it and kind of understand it. But, uh, you know, Melanie, I'll start with you because we brought it up earlier. Do you think that Fleming captures the American idiom pretty well? Look, you know, I think he did a pretty good job. It's always really hard for me whenever I read his books and he tries to write an accent. That's, mm. that's really hard for me to read. I really wish he didn't do that. Um, I understand what he was going for. Uh, as far as like the, the places, the uh, like the cheap hotels with the paper across the toilets or the greasy spoon diners, or even when he gets to the glitz and glam of Vegas and these old ghost towns. I loved all those aspects. I just wish he wouldn't have attempted to try to write our accent. And I have that complaint with uh, like, you know, even TV shows, or if you you have someone who's clearly not uh, familiar with that dialect or that accent and they get thrown into an acting role trying to pull it off. Oh. It's just painful. It can Especially be so New painful. York, like New York, you know, you got to put a lot of nasal in there. You got to run all your words together. You don't get anything. I mean, if you're from Long Island, you know, it's crazy. Well, and I grew up in Louisiana, so that's even <laughs> equally as painful. I, I couldn't even do that. What is that? More cayenne pepper, onion? I, I don't know. Oh, that, 
you know, the Cajun accents. Uh, I'm not, I'm not even going to try because I've lived <laughs> away from there far long Melanie, enough. So if you're not trying, you haven't drank enough of that black uh, velvet <laughs> or diamond you have. I, I, I know when I drink more, the sugars and darlings start to come out. So mm. <laughs> I haven't heard one darling in the hour and nine minutes we've been on. And now I'm disappointed. I, I need to break out my all y'alls. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Hit me like a square jaw. I love it. Hey, Mike. As yeah. a, as a, as a dyed in the wool, New Jerseyan, Ooh. American, you gotta, you gotta talk to Ace Toots here. I mean, you know, did, did they capture the American, uh, aspect here? I, I would have to say that they, they came close. He, he sort of, you know, the, the Italian mafia, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, live and let die. You know, with the you know the black uh, accents from Harlem and all that he built up, I think it's the same thing. I think the rest of it is is kind of vanilla. It, it fits. Hmm. I don't think he's catching capturing really the, the even though he mentioned it once in a while. The, the uh, one of the, the driver I think that picks him up is from Brooklyn, and so he throws a little of that in. But I don't think he pushes it too far. I think uh, which is probably a good thing. Uh, it is but, a good thing, and I will tell you. Um, I will say this, and I hope Melanie. And Mike will agree with me. He did it better than I think a lot of Americans do of, uh, you know, British and British accents, where we all, and, and I'm just putting this on myself, where we all kind of make British people, unfortunately, sound like chimney sweeps from Mary Poppins, you know, and, and that's, that's a detriment because you all sound like your rocket scientists in everything that you say. And I'm an Anglophile, so I can say that with uh, a palm. Um, Paul, we are so wonderfully going to move to you in uh, locations, because you're in a location that is not America. No. But I will tell you, one of the things that this, comp uh, this company, this uh, book gets really nice thumbs up from, and I'll, I'll, I'll give it as well, is the wonderful locations, Specterville. The Queen Elizabeth, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, New York City. What did you think about the uh, location hopping here? And I'd have to say the book opens in West Africa, not a place we often find Bond, right? Holy I think, hell, right. Is, is this the only time we have Bond in Africa with Fleming? I know we have him a few times in the movies and then William Boyd's continuation novel had him set in Africa. But it's fantastic to see. And I love, you know, as Melanie pointed out earlier, this the book opens up with a very a focus on insects the scorpion and then it pans out dramatically so it shows you exactly where they're located between french guinea as it was then sierra leone and liberia and 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 that's that's great it really adds a cinematic quality to the opening of the book um that's fantastic and then you start to learn about the, the diamond industry there I, this this is why i was super excited when i started this um when it got to America, it was also very, oh, I should also point out, this is the one and I think only time that Bond, Fleming's Bond at least, drops into Ireland. He stops in Shannon Airport. And there's a very amusing passage where he, 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 he disses the, the tacky stuff that is in the shops there. He calls it the brass leprechauns and, and, and stuff like that. And I, I, I have a slightly amusing anecdote if you'll indulge me for a moment. I checked this out and there is, a, there is an article online where a most fastidious gentleman called John Ryan uh, was, uh, he was head of personnel at, at Shannon Airport at the time. And he, he read this passage to the staff who were quite incensed and they wrote to Fleming and they said, we do not sell cheap crap in uh, in our shop. In fact, we sell high quality Irish linens, Swiss watches, and he, he listed a whole bunch of other things. And Fleming wrote back to him, to his credit, and said, he said, I, I travel through Shannon often, because Shannon Airport was, at the time when, you know, you, when planes had to refuel more often, it was a stopover from, from American flights. So there was a lot of traffic through there. And he said... Uh, uh, I stop over frequently. And the next time I, I come in, I'd like to apologize. And he goes, but then he ruined it at the end by going, hopefully by then uh, all the crap will have been bought up by the, the American GIs. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I found because that. Of uh, course he said example. that. Yeah. So uh, that was a lovely little Fleming sort of apology slash backslap, but great. You know, we, we all suffer under the, under the wrath of, Fle of Fleming at some point, I think, you know, it was, it was great. 
But I, I, you know, to your point, I loved the location hopping. I love it in the movies. I love it in the books. I've come to expect that I actually thought it was well done. And then I read some of the research about how he's actually gone to some of these places. And I'm like, of course, so he's, he's recounting, he's like gorillas in the mist. Yeah. You know, he's recounting his own experiences. And, and Melanie, early on, you talked about Specterville as a location. You must have been enthralled that they were jumping from so many different places. Liked it. Um, I actually, I know we were talking earlier about the pace in the book, but I'm going to go back to that because I actually liked that there was that there was so much happening. Uh, and again, at the beginning, I said I preferred this to Moonraker. Moonraker was one that I found was a lot harder to get through mm. because I didn't find there to be as much action. I thought the car chase was better. I thought the characters were better. I liked all of the different characters rather than dealing with just one or two. Um, I, I frankly liked that it was really mixed up and everything was in there. Uh, but I think that's that's something to be said uh, with the films as well. There are people who love The Man with the Golden Gun where it's got everything in it. And then there are people who like, uh, you know, From Russia with Love. So, <laughs> you know, uh, there's something for everyone. This one was much more my speed, much more my book. I love the different locations, all the different aspects the horse race and Vegas and I mean the mud bath everything loved it the Queen Elizabeth it was wonderful it was amazing absolutely and, and Mike I mean as somebody who in the last year has traveled all the way from Piscataway New Jersey to Patterson New Jersey which is only one zip code away from each other um, what did you think about the location jumping oh I, I thought it was great I, I loved it you know that, that even even the trip sometimes in, you know, from each each destination where he left and where he, his destination was, I thought it was great that the, the Studlak trip with uh, with Felix. I mean, it's just the banter that went on in the car, and the talk about the key offer uh, report, and uh, was it the the uh, uh, sports was it the sports writer? You know, read yeah. this article, and it, it it was it was just everything so it was not just the destination, but in between, and he spent so much time like in Saratoga. You know, you could say, well, maybe it started dragging, but no, I loved every moment and all those descriptions that happened in Saratoga and even Vegas. And, and I got to bring this weird point up. One of my favorite little points is I think Lit Lighter is Fleming's uh, showing his love of the United States. So the stuff mm -hmm. he didn't like about the U.S., Lighter was like the positive. Remember, he made, made a comment once about Texas, like the best of the United States is the people from Texas type of thing, whatever. I forget the exact quote, but I, one of their meals, once again, my favorite, the avocado comes out. And it's like, wow, you can get avocados in the United States. You can get them in Europe, but you're not getting any of those in England. And it was just like one of those. The avocado yeah. pear. It's, it's like a dessert. Exactly. Is with, what with, he calls it. Yeah, and, with, and by the way, Mike, you and I are, are, you know, we've, we've talked about this a decade ago. We've, we're cut from the same cloth where, you know, the lifestyle aspect that Fleming brings to the table is his encounters when he travels. So, I mean, one of the things I never felt, I mean, there's some people that are like, oh, this is the book where he shows his disdain of uh, America. And I, I wholeheartedly disagree. Just like I wholeheartedly disagree that he shows his disdain of, of certain things, because quite frankly, I think it's a celebration. I mean, he talks about, you know, in so many of his books, he talks about things like uh, food in the United States, like chicken in a basket, you know, Miller, you know, sure. all the things that he can celebrate. And it's the most simplistic things. It isn't yeah. Chateaubriand, you know, it, it is the most simplistic things that the United States brings to bear. I think Fleming had a wonderful celebration of the United States. And 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 please, folks, I'm, I'm sure I'll get comments. This isn't me trying to be a sycophant to the United States. I'm not. I, I know we've got our foibles. I'm talking about, I think that Fleming was able, like the most positive people in the world, able to enjoy the most incredible things wherever he was. And this book brings it out. Am I wrong, Mike? No, you know, I think if you compare this book to Live and Let Die, I think Live and Let Die was a little bit more on the negative side. Remember, Bond had to redo his entire wardrobe to fit American taste. And there's some, the sack suit, I think he mentions. So he downgrades, if you but, will. But, 
to fit let me, in. Let me, let, me, let me put out my mug and say, fight me, Mike. Um, what about when him and Leiter in Live and Let Die went clubbing and yeah. they went to all the amazing clubs. They went to five or six clubs like you and I have done. And we've gone to different <laughs> places in New York City and just had the time of our lives. Fleming did that in his book as well. So even though he had to wear a sack suit, which by the way, he's right to say, you go to Joseph A. Banks, you buy an American-ish suit, it's yeah. going to hang on you like, you know, it's two sizes too big. Yeah, yeah. By the way, we've now downgraded from a Bond book club to now a sartorial thing. Apologies everywhere. Yeah. That, 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 that's right. But, you know, it's, I, I'm just comparing, you know, he, how he was more, a little bit more, negative in the live and let die this one his cover is he's an englishman and that's what he's supposed to be so even when he gets, shows up in vegas is that the first time i think when when cuneo meets him he knows right away oh the limey when he's he's called the names like that i think even uh, uh shady tree calls him that the limey whatever or all the spang brothers but he exuded that if you want to call it that that english proper aloofness and dress so he didn't bother to to detail the dress so much what he was wearing which is what he Good always point. wears his kit but that was his his image to go through like that where the other book he was trying to blend in and becoming more american looking and i will give you that i mean a hundred percent the one thing i walked away and i i folks the filter of how we see these books and movies is our filter and you'll have to forgive us, but it makes us wonderfully different. It's part of the spice of the Bond community. We see different things and different things that we see. Um, this was pretty lackluster when it came to lifestyle. I mean, there were some, some great descriptions of meals and things like that, but I wasn't getting, you know, the, the, the typical things like in Casino Royale, but Paul, I want to address you for a moment. I mean, did you walk away thinking like, oh, he nailed Americanism? Um, and, and by the way, you're amongst friends. There's nobody watching this. So <laughs> what did you think? Well, first of all, I, I would like to say I don't, I, I too searched for that America bashing that I'd read about in the critiques. And I thought, you know, I mean, Fleming has a so, somewhat of a snobbishness about him with many things, but I, 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 I wasn't sure I saw the, the thrashing of America that, 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 he's given credit for sometimes in this particular book um yeah in terms of how how i felt about his americanisms i mean i'm i'm a tourist so i was like okay that's how they talk that's how they talk you know and i read it and i sort of had you know it was kind of a for some reason danny devito's voice was popping out at me for the ernie cureo that's probably completely wrong you know <laughs> this is what you get when you give <laughs> books to you know. Just, yeah, that's generic American. I'll go with that. Yeah. So, but it, it like a lot of the dialogue was quite um, 1950s. Even Bond's own dialogue, you know, where he says like in one point he says I can't remember what Tiffany says, but he says uh, you know, don't be a goose. You know, it's like ooh, with with talk like that, you're probably a big hit with the ladies, Mister Bond. You know, but you know there there is kind of sort of slightly banal or maybe dated dialogue that seeps in whether it's English or whether it's American or, or whatever. But for me, the, the, the color that they like, you can imagine me as a, as a, as a teenager reading this for the first time, uh, never having been to America, reading about like Saratoga and Vegas. And yeah, sure, it was still in the 50s. But like, it, it was a fabulously colorful experience for me. Like we, we grew up with America in that small box in the corner that is the TV. Hmm. that's really how we we experience it until we go there it's, it's a very different place to europe and and so reading about it and seeing it on tv is, is and, and there was a tremendous amount of richness in in in, in fleming but i can't so, speak to um, whether it's accurate or not well paul i will tell you the chat room wholeheartedly agrees with you darren hayes for example says america was a dream to most yeah. in the uk in 1955 and fleming reflected that so it wasn't you know, as so many people would say is a bashing. I think it's the reflection and the filter that you put it through, but it was a lifting up. It was almost like, you know, look at the experience that I'm having. And um, that's, that's an interesting point. All right. We've got to do something that the chat room has been doing very naturally for the first hour and a half. And by the way, I want to thank everybody for uh, the wonderful comments. I mean, the chat room is as colorful 
as uh, really the rainbow. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, wonderful conversations. And, um, you know, Marcel Bauer, Bauer, for example, says, me as a German, I didn't recognize any of that American bashing. I mean, there's a conversation that is, is worth reading later. And I want to thank all, also my co-hosts. I want to move into something that we, we typically have to do because we are humans. Many of us, maybe all of us, have watched Diamonds Are Forever, the movie, before we read Diamonds are forever the novel. Now, there are people like um, A.J. Chowdhury, David West. Uh, there are so many other people who were came out of the womb and started reading the Fleming novels before they saw the movie. <laughs> but we're not all that fortunate. Womb reading, as it were. Um, so let's talk about this. Because as I was reading it, I, I, I confessed early on that I had trouble with Winton Kidd. Melanie... Were you able to see comparisons? Could you almost get into the mind of Eon that when they started to think, let's make a Diamonds Are Forever movie from the book, let's add these things from the book, they'll seem book-ish. Could you get that feeling? And, and, and what were those movie book moments? I know. I was so heartbroken that Klaus Hergesheimer's Section G was not checking radiation shields. What the F? What the F? I mean, uh, no, I, I think the way, the, and I, I have seen, um, with the exception of Casino Royale, um, all of the movies I'd seen before I'd read the books. And uh, this was, I've, I've never pictured Bond, uh, the literary Bond, um, I know some people will read the books and say, oh, I picture Timothy Dalton or oh, I picture. Mm. I've never seen any of the actors when I've read Literary Bond. Uh, same thing with Tiffany. I saw a totally different woman, but 100 percent, David, I was right with you. I missed Wint and Kid. There's something that they're so evil. And then the fact that they're so like, you know, joke they make jokes about it and have these pithy little lines just makes them that much more sinister at least to me I mean uh and I I missed them uh you know I, I think the the books had their own fantastic elements I mean and I I understand that Fleming is trying to infuse uh you know some of his themes and things into the characters you know the sucking of the thumb and the kid and all of the the winter being the dead season of the you know year and stuff like that. Uh, I get all of that, but I really missed the that humor. I did. It just makes them so much more evil. So that was kind of my big takeaway from the book when I was reading it. I I did miss them. I I it's interesting. I almost had a bingo card in my head. Let, let, let. Let's call it a psychological bingo card because we're friends. I, you know, there was a dentist mention. So we had the whole dentist thing from the movie to the book. We had Peter Franks, obviously, you know, the, the, which I love. I love that whole Peter Franks thing. We had Tiffany Case um, and her explanation of the name from the books. Shady Tree. We had Vegas. We had Queen Elizabeth. You know, we had the whole ship at the end, you know, the, the bon surprise. Um, we had Scorpions. But I, I did, I was fighting. And I think I was fighting because the other books, the other three books that I read up until this one or reread, um, I, I wasn't fighting the movie so much, but Diamonds Are Forever is so intrusive, good or bad, that it just tends to infiltrate us. I mean, Paul, what, what, did, what did you have? Did you have a fight? Was it, was it smooth sailing? book comparison 100% agree thing? With what, Mel what melanie said i mean i i am the same i do not envisage a sp specific actor for for bond or for uh tiffany but it, you're a hundred percent bang on they they embody those characters and particularly since um you know um winter kid it's got out of my head wasn't the actor he was the bass player the jazz guy um yeah. the chat will know who i'm talking about the name has fallen out of my head but like they're so fantastic and um you know what's interesting as well and and do you know what's great about this community is like there's a lot of um lgbt people in the bond community as well who love wint and kid and i find that really interesting as well because you know in the book 
like there is there is a direct correlation between being gay and being a bad guy felix Leiter says it explicitly and mm-hmm. and you know if, if even in like goldfinger it's even more the parallel is even more ridiculous where pussy galore is kind of a lesbian while she's a while she's on the side of goldfinger and she flips from being a lesbian uh, and being and to be on the side of good yeah. simultaneously so there's a there's a a parallel there that is is probably not that palatable today but yet the way they handle it in the film it's just very enjoyable and it's it, 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 even though it is to use an overused term problematic it's still fantastic and they're and they they they've just they're such cultural icons when i went to the casino royale thing in secret cinema in london the yeah. first two people i saw were two guys dressed in the most appalling ridiculous cheap costumes of wint and kid and everybody loved them they were fantastic i ignored all the rest of the actors that were there for casino Royale. i was like these two guys so that was great you know you know aj aj Chaudhry and i were going to go as wint and kid and we couldn't decide who was going to be who so we just scrapped <laughs> the whole thing um but but next time they do secret cinema diamonds of forever which i'm sure is right around the corner because what a beloved film um you know you'll you'll see and by the way i have to tell you what's interesting is 2021 which is literally around the corner is going to see an anniversary a major anniversary of diamonds are forever so i mean mike this is a perfect conversation to have right now leading into next year but i mean as somebody that loves the films and the movies were you able to make the correlation as as far as when the movie came out well no 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 i mean you know when you read through this were you like you know the character i i loved wind and kid in the book because they were just so so evil as melanie said it was just you you dreaded them coming into a scene and that last scene and and they're playing they're sitting there playing gin whatever while they got you know uh tiffany whatever and the chair tied up whatever she was sitting there and they're just calmly having a good time with the they're being paid what was it ten thousand or twenty thousand to, to offer and he's like what wow, this is this is a good deal um the movie it's not the same characters but i enjoyed them i just watched it this afternoon before this and it's been a long time since i watched the movie but i'm like you know i like them but it's not the same with and kid they they it was an interesting and it's it's almost i always feel like diamonds are forever i saw it in the theater when it came out and as a kid i watched it and said what's going on to my James Bond? And then of course, then Roger Moore came in after that. And that seemed like the lead in to the, the humorous, the joviality that would, you know, would hit a, you know, a, a peak during the Moore years. Yeah. So I don't dislike the movie version. It's just that they're different and should not be compared to the book version. Well, that's, that's a good, sharp, strong statement. And, and, and actually the chat room, echoes what you just said, Mike, which, you know, I'll, I'll quote Tim Hans, who says 1971 to 2021 is 50 years. And I think what he means is, you know, don't, don't look at 2021 eyes through a 1971 lens. So when I was a kid watching Diamonds Are Forever, and I remember this very well, you know, ABC, Channel 7, New York, upstate New York, my, my father says, hey, we're going to watch a Bond film and we watch Diamonds of Forever. There was nothing where, you know, the, the two of them, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, overt, but it was a system where, you know, they were fun, you know, where the yeah. book is, they are business. And I think that's, that's some of the things that if I read some of the reviews of the book versus the movie, and we start to look at the henchmen at versus the movie, that's where we start to make the delineation. And let's face it, I don't know if the chat room would argue this, but the movie is a bit 1971 silliness. And maybe it should be, because 1971 was a time when we needed, not had to, needed and wanted to embrace a certain amount of silliness. 1956, when this book came out, it wasn't about silliness. It was about escapism. And so I think we need to kind of put ourselves into that mind frame. I mean, Melanie, what do you think about that? I mean, I'd love to get your point of view of, 
When we look at any Bond film or any Bond book, we tend to do it from the time that we're in as opposed to the time that it came out. How does that kind of change your point of view or maybe not? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think this sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier where um, it's, it's difficult to be a feminist sometimes mm. and watch some of these older films uh, the way things are handled, the way women are treated, and you can't. Uh, it's the same thing when you read these books and uh, you see just, I mean, flat out racism or uh, homophobia, you know, all of these things mentioned. And I think it's one thing that we can be thankful that we are moving forward and, uh, you know, moving away from these stereotypes and prejudices but uh, it's just with any author writing at any time, you can't sit down and read Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain uh, today without putting yourself back in that time. You just can't. Uh, and we have to try to see what the author is trying to tell us yeah. and try to remove ourselves from that. And the same goes for film and television. It's interesting because, uh, you know, I just, and, and you may have seen this, I just interviewed Dr. Lisa Funnel who you know, obviously does you know, college studies on this. This is her vocation. And one of the things that we did agree on absolutely is that you know, to go back to the 1960s film or even the 50s books and to try to put them through a particular filter, we're just going to have pain and regret as opposed to really appreciating them for the historical moments. And then you have people like Paul Lally, who is a misogynistic pig, a relic of the Cold War, <laughs> who really hasn't moved out of that, Paul. I mean, Just, you must have been I'm, very- I'm really annoyed home. that you had to invite a woman on here, David, to be honest with you, you know? Um, <laughs> well, I did invite you, yes. Hey, nice. <laughs> uh, I, I just like to make one comment on that. And I, I think, you know, great comment by Tim as well, but I think it's, it's impossible not to view a film from the 70s through the lens that you are currently in. Mm. Um, but what I think, th what, it, what it does is like, something like Bond, no, Bond is not going away. He's such a popular hero. The stories are so popular. So you, you have this, these stories with these, um, you know, like Fleming's attitudes towards race, women and, and uh, LGBTQ people are, is, poof, it's, it's, it's a hairdryer of shock for, for yeah. people in the, uh, but what do we do with that? It raises the question, what do we do with it? Do we raise it up and say, okay, you know what? That was from the time, this is fantasy. We know that that's bonkers, but we just move on. Or do we do, we, do, we do something about it? And if so, what do we do about it? Mm. And we, nobody can answer that question, but, but each an individual reader, it, and you have to use your own power of critical thinking. And like maybe for example, if you had kids and they were 12 or 13 and they wanted to investigate more Bond, you go, this is a great book, but heads up, there's some weird shit when it comes to race and gay people and stuff. So just watch it. Maybe come talk to me about that. You know, maybe we just need to be aware of it and acknowledge it and deal with it as we are as individuals. But um, but uh, yeah, I think it's difficult to just go back and sit there and go fit into the 50s. Like I can't, I can't do that, you know. So it's a strange one. But we all love Bond, so we make the effort to do it. Paul, I, you uh, you came back from that so perfectly because you're absolutely right. I mean, I've learned probably in 2020, I've learned more from my son, who is 24 going on 52, um, <laughs> than anybody else. Because, you know, I saw Bond a certain way and I saw Bond as a, um, it's interesting, a frozen point in time. And what I've learned from people like Melanie and just even what you talked about and, and and Dr. Lisa and others is that it's not the lack of appreciation or changing bond or the nostalgia of bond. It's, it's really, it's the discussions. It's this, it's what we're having now. It's how do you have a discussion about uh, morality and, and connecting. And, and as long as we all know that this is like I, you said it, I'll use your words, male fantasy. Um, although I'll just say fantasy that it is something that is derivative of what we are all living. I think it's a marker. Uh, I'm going to use, oh my gosh, Bobby Morelli is saying my words. Bobby Morelli says it's a marker of how much progress has been made. Still work to be yeah. done, of course, but progress nonetheless. That's where the chat room is right now. Good point. And they're absolutely correct. Bond doesn't just need to be entertainment. It can be infotainment, which is information that allows us to really explore our own lives. And that's when it's becoming 
more multidimensional, which is so interesting. Now, I know this is all lost on Mike, but Mike, how do you feel about this discussion right now? I'm glad you brought me in because I think these books are a, a, a focus on that time period and the author. And as we were talking, what keeps going on and on in my mind is I compare this. We, we mentioned Mark Twain. Right. You know, he wrote. And if you read his books, they, they are they are pretty much anti-slavery. But people look at the words. They don't focus on the story being told. And my favorite uh, example of this is the movie Blazing Saddles, one of the greatest, you know, anti-bigotry movie there is. And yet, did we really advance since then? Because now people watch it and are appalled. You're like, don't you get it? Hmm. They, it's, it's, it's speaking against bigotry and racism. And if you watch it on, on the network TV, they pulled out all of these segments or, or they changed the words that they find will be offensive. So it ends up being a slapstick comedy and with no real background, no, no, no real message behind it. And I think uh, Fleming, he, he was flawed. He had his view. He was kind of stuffy. He was like a little upper crust looking down on things, but that's his view. And you're seeing it through his, his eyes and you, you can accept it for what it is or what it isn't, but you can't, you can't point a finger at the guy. That's, that's his life. That's what he, he knew. But I, I could I could almost and and I, I I I fully support what you're saying. I could almost support the idea that Fleming was incredibly progressive, as as oh, yeah. stuffy as foundational as he was in what his beliefs were in what 1950s Britain was. Yeah. Um, and again, it's all speculation from an American in the 2020. Um, you know, he had some incredibly strong women written yeah. in a time where strong women were, uh, you know, victims, for example, mm -hmm. and, and men were not victims. And he wrote Bond. You know, I, I love it when people say, I need Bond to be, you know, just absolutely superlative and a Superman. And it's like, really? Because that's not how Fleming wrote Bond. I mean, Casino Royale, when I re-addressed Casino Royale, beginning of this year, 2020, dumpster fire aside, I reread Casino Royale. And I was shocked that a third of the book is about Bond falling apart. And why? Because love disarmed him. I mean, that's incredibly progressive. So I don't, I don't know if Fleming is given his, his due in all of this. Am I wrong? Another, another point about, sorry to interrupt, but there, oh, you know, if you think about where Fleming started, when he was born, women didn't have the right to vote yet in Britain. So it's a marker of where he's come. Now, I'm not championing Fleming as a, a you know, a, a champion of women's cause. I'm not saying that at all. But you certainly have, by the time he got to the war, uh, the women were performing roles that they never, you know, never would have been imaginable before. So there, there, there is a, an arc of, of female progression throughout Fleming's lifetime that's interesting to watch in parallel with the way they are developed in the novels as well. So that's just something worth considering as well. Well, Paul, you you nailed it. And by the way, the chat room is a lit with this, is Rishkava, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm going to mispronounce you, Rishkavayi Raguras, and I apologize, I'm butchering your name, uh, he mentions Blazing Saddles, and he said it was a satire of racism. Mm -hmm. It wasn't celebrating racism, just like Sheriff Pepper, you know, uh, from you know the first two Roger Moore films, isn't celebrating his racism. It's making it a buffoon, mm -hmm. and and I think that's the progressiveness of the Bond franchise, whether it's the books or otherwise. I mean, Melanie, what do you think about all this? A hundred percent. And what you said, David, about Fleming was not given enough credit. I, I mean, that is one thing that this was not an author that just, you know, cranked out little pulp novels. He has some very, very serious themes in here. He's trying to say a lot. Uh, he's totally embedded it with a lot of symbolism. Um, this was something that I mentioned um, for all of my buddies in the chat. Uh, I'm normally money penny. And uh, it's chatting along with you. And it was something that I mentioned in Live and Let Die, how he's infusing the seven deadly sins very, very clearly in these books. 
I mean, he was a fantastic author and just was never given enough credit uh, for his work and what he was really trying to tell us. Just his social commentary, his uh, sort of moral theology or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, I think most people look at these and they're fun little paperback spy novels, but I think there's so much more to them. Oh, we're so nervous. Think yeah. about it. And, and I'm going to bring up something that you know, it is very difficult to bring up in this day and age because, you know, eggshells are walking. Um, and, and the chat room is discussing this very thing, not perfected yet, um, says absolutely right about J.W. Pepper. We're supposed to laugh at him, never with him. I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, I know there is a lot of uh, critique and there should be. I mean, it's fun. Critique, uh, as we've recently discovered, is, is, is celebration. You know, when we when we pick apart things, but you know, the Bond franchise, whether it be the movie or these books, as I go through these books, as I, as I re-engage with these books, I feel that Fleming has so gone up a ladder rung or two because he is finger pointing. He is the problem observer and the problem eliminator all in one. Because where some people have, have leaned back and said, he's part of the bourgeois, the 1950s, and he's racist and he's all these things. I think he's putting a magnifying glass on this. And, and again, nobody's paying us. Uh, I think Paul and Melanie and, and Mike can attest. In fact, this has been a lot of work. Um, but it is something that it, it should be celebrated that he's put this out. I mean, Mike, you know, I know we're getting complicated here, but what do you, what do you think about this discussion? I think it's, I think it's hit right in the head. It, he was way ahead of his time. He really was as far as uh, society, where it was going. And then re just recently, over the last few years, uh, Melanie mentioned, I think Melanie mentioned about uh, uh, women didn't have the, the, uh, the right to vote, you know, at the beginning when he was a kid, it built up. And by World War II, here he is, steeped in intelligence operations. And now we're seeing more and more stories coming about, coming out about women that were behind the lines in Europe, in Germany, that were doing things, coordinating with uh, the French resistance and doing clandestine operations. And I, I can't believe how many books have come up lately. And he had to have some knowledge of that going on in the, back, going on in the background along with his operations, yeah. these women were out there feeding information back and some of them didn't make it out, make it out alive from the war. It's true. And it's very sad. And Mike, you would appreciate this. Walter Von Tagen the third, not the second, and certainly not the first, the third says, David, you call that a shake? So from a lifestyle standpoint, my shaking uh, persona has really taken a hit in this video. But, you know, um, some people say some really great things. First of all, Mathieu, Eau Claire, and I know I'm pronouncing your name right, says, I feel like I'm back in college doing a book analysis, which I love doing. So thank you. But uh, Fulano Detal says, I think the reason, and he calls him Sergeant Pepper, not Sheriff Pepper, which I actually love, love rubs so many Americans the wrong way is because while he's a funny buffoon to non-Americans, many Americans, hold on, wait for it personally know a J.W. Pepper and they're exhausting. And as I will tell you, I know a J.W. Pepper in my life. And I'm not saying his name is Joe Darlington. I'm not saying his name is not Joe Darlington. Melanie, I grew do you up know in Louisiana. Oh, you, oh, you, oh, I grew Melanie, up in Louisiana. I, you, I was going to say Louisiana. Melanie, do you know a, a J.W. Pepper in your life? Oh, to, uh, to, I think I know maybe one or two men who are not J.W. Pepper <laughs> having grown and, and the rest in are. Louisiana. Oh, it was, uh, you know, Live and Let Die was, uh, that's how I got into James Bond. I thought it was the coolest thing ever to have a spy tooling around Louisiana. And uh, I love J.W. Pepper. I agree he's a buffoon. I do know guys, men, half my, half my friends' dads were just like J.W. Pepper. <laughs> so... <laughs> Mike, what about you? I mean, as somebody from, you know, New Jersey, you must be surrounded. By JWs? <laughs> uh, you know, it, I, I had a thought about that. Because, you know, remember, I grew up actually in Virginia. 
you know, I, I was born in, Bay, in in New Jersey, but I ended up growing up down there. And then I ended up coming back to Jersey years and years later. But uh, I don't know. I think that whole persona, um, it's, it, 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 it's got its peaks and valleys uh, as you go through mm-hmm. it. I think the last few years, of, we've seen a lot of that accepted. Here we are, th- thought we were progressing forward, and suddenly it's okay to be JW. And I'm like, what happened? Are we supposed to be moving forward here? So, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's very sad, you know. Uh, and in fact, I was thinking about a friend of mine who once said, someone was going to Europe or going on vacation. And he turned and he said, this is a Jersey guy. Why would you want to go to Europe? We got everything you want here in the United States. And I was like, that sounds like something JW would say. <laughs> the, the guy really has no real focus on yeah. world and and let's go one more step then later on i i can't say the movie what the movie was roger moore james bond um is in was it thailand or whatever and there's jw so it's like maybe he had an impact on jw and now he's expanding he's actually going overseas on vacation to see other countries so i thought maybe there's some hope here yeah. i totally Man agree the and by guy. the way um i do want to just go back for a moment and it'll only be for 20 seconds or so. Shamir uh, says that Pam Bouvier can teach me some shaking techniques, oh. <laughs> which I get, which he showed in, uh, you know, LTK, which I totally get. So well pointed. My, um, my favorite Bond girl. <laughs> right. She's right there. All right. Let's She's stick okay. with diamonds are forever. <laughs> one, one thing I do want to end on is kind of, you know, what I like to call the afterglow which Mike, it's not what you think. And it's not what your beautiful wife, Deneen, who's that redhead. Is she Deneen? Is that her name? Donna. What's her name? Donna, damn it. Donna. Do I have to remember that? Is she redheaded? No, no. No, she's blonde. Can we call her Deneen and can we just accept her as a redhead? Is that easier? Or Tom Zaritsky. Sure. He's not whatever. great with names. I, I, don't, I don't want to task you too much. Whatever. Paul, whatever. don't cross we, me. We all know who you're talking about. We all know who it is. Paul, you and I are like this. Don't go like this. That's all I ask. Um, So listen, what we'd like to do, we've got about 10 minutes left. You've all been amazing. What a great conversation in the chat room. What a great conversation with my co-hosts. They've all come to the table with so much. I'd like to do a summation. And, you know, now that we've gotten through Diamonds of Forever and we move to another book, I'd like to get kind of an overview because we've discussed it. And that's the nice thing about this is, I find that a book is a book is a book until we discuss it with friends and then it becomes something else. It becomes a living entity. Melanie, talk to me, you know, the overarching experience with Diamonds of Forever. What's your takeaway? Oh, I thought it was beautifully written. Um, I would like to close with one thing that I, you know, I was trying to make this point about one of the things that I loved about this book was a lot of the symbolism and the, Uh, that was infused into it. And uh, sort of the main themes that I saw was the, you know, uh, nothing is forever, only death Mm. and diamonds. I loved that. I loved all of the examples of that throughout the book. And then the other thing that I really saw, which I thought was summed up beautifully, um, this is going to be in chapter 24, death is so permanent. Uh, There's a quote in here, Um, And this is Bond sat, it was right after he received the telegraph, Bond sat frozen for a moment in his chair. Suddenly there flashed unwanted into his mind that most sinister line in all of poetry. Mm. They reckon ill who leave me out. When they fly, I am the wings, which is Mm. Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, poem, Brahma, which summed this up beautifully because Brahma is all about contradictions. And uh, I think what Fleming was really trying to tell us here was about being a hypocrite, Uh, all the hypocrisy that we're dealing with. Uh, I thought it was beautifully written. And uh, like I said, nothing is permanent. Uh, We're going to get through this together. So I thought this was the perfect book to read during this time. And those are the closing notes that I would like to leave everyone with. Melanie, you are... um... You are a gift as far as really transcending this conversation. So thank you. That's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. Mike, overview. 
Give us a summation of this. I, I thought it was a great Bond novel. Um, he hit, he, he took all the basics, the meeting with M, the handing off the mission, a little bit of a lifestyle, you know, go to lunch with, uh, with, with Bill Tanner, whatever, and then going out. But then it's not the typical novel. It's this adventure. He's totally on his own. He's got to do his thing. And he gets a lot of philosophical points in there. Uh, the, the line in the last few chapters, uh, he starts talking about when you first meet a woman and you, I, I can't get too detailed with it. Maybe I can here, but okay. when you finally, when you finally know it's going to happen, the, the mm -hmm. hand on the thigh type description and in, in, in hit with him and Tiffany, and then the whole overview of death and I think there's a few quotes that pop up, but one of them I saw was, was it, Mr. Nothing is forever. Only death is permanent. Nothing is forever except what you did to me. What she's thinking mm. of as he looks down on the dead, I think it's the kid's body with his blank eyes looking up at him. Yeah. yeah. That's where it all comes down to. It's amazing. Yeah, well done, Mike. Well done, Mike. And I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think there are so many things that you can take away from this. Uh, it, it's it's interesting because I, I think, you know, it's that whole thing of what we discussed is what you bring in to this, you can also take away. Uh, Paul, you know, yeah. what, what, what are you leaving with? With this well, one, I, I love the depth that Michael and, and Melanie find in this novel. And it, it is really, it's brilliant to hear such a, a novel that often gets a little bit panned being so positively reported. I am going to say that I do not think it is a great Fleming edition. I think it's a very, very good one. Um, you and Joe have this thing where you talk about sex and pizza and you make some analogy. I, I, I tend to leave you to it, but you know, <laughs> a, a, any Fleming book is worth a read if you're, if you're a fan. I would say to someone just coming to those Fleming novels, don't go for this one first, but it is so rich, whether you just want to find about the locations, whether you just want to find about uh, a Bond's character, whether you just want to yeah. find out a little bit about the history of the time, what was going on. It's just like, it took me ages to read this book because I kept Googling and going down rabbit holes and I had such a great time with it. If you're a Bond fan, there is loads to be enjoyed with this. Don't dismiss it. Uh, it's not the best one you'll ever read, but it is great, great fun. I totally agree. And by the way, that that quote is something that I quoted to Joe, where I basically said, and 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 I apologize for the indelicate nature of the way I'm going to bring this across, is that, um, you know, bond anything, bond movies and also bond books, including Diamonds of Forever, are like pizza and sex. When you have bad pizza, it's still pizza. It still, still tastes pretty good. And and sex, think of your worst sexual experience. It, was it that bad? It probably wasn't. I mean, you know, could have ended a little yeah, earlier well, for some <laughs> other than others. Yeah, it probably did. But I never liked that, that, that quote. I, I, no, it, it, it was, was still pretty bad. damn good. I mean, how can it be bad? <laughs> It's the same with Fleming and it's the same with Bond. So it's, it's the most indelicate, um, probably American version of a descriptor of uh, Bond anything. But I will say too, I went into Diamonds Are Forever. I haven't read it in a long time. I went into it hearing that, oh, you know, it's going to be a bit of a slog. I will be very honest. I, I picked it up probably six or seven times, whereas the other ones I just read right through. However... This conversation, honestly, this conversation has elevated through the eyes of Melanie, through the eyes of Paul, through the eyes of Mike, um, everything just becomes brighter. And I don't mean to sound crunchy or granola, but it's true. Uh, this is what the Bond community is about. You know, we, we have our moments where we see peaks and valleys and everything rises if you allow it. So I will end it with this. And this is how we're going to end this particular live stream. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for everybody joining. It's been a, a wonderful group. The chat room has been a lit with discussion. Everybody's hung in there. Um, it's been a great discussion, but we will return with From Russia With Love because the one thing we don't know about is when we're going to see a new movie, but we will definitely, definitely have the Bond book club return. I want to toast all of the hosts. 
I want to toast all of you. And this has been David Zaritsky from the Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks, David.